name of our Lord Jesus, Lord, that you will anoint me for this message, for this purpose, for this reason. Lord, we are believing for revival. We are believing in a life-giving word that will bring change to our hearts today in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Ephesians 5.14 says this. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ shall shine upon you. We need to awaken from our slumber church. We need to awaken to see the times that we are living in today. We need to awaken for us to have a reflection of our wretchedness without Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back for broken vessels. He is coming back for those that are desperate for Him. He is coming back for those that cannot do anything without their God. The church of Jesus Christ needs to awaken from its slumber, needs to awaken from its apathy, needs to awaken from all things that would stop the church from entering into the day of the rapture when Jesus Christ will come back and snatch his bride away. God is giving out the warnings. He is giving out the signs in this hour. But he is coming to shake. That's right. He wants to shake the very foundations of your faith. He is coming to shake the church once again. The Bible says that as the disciples were praying in Acts 3. In Acts 4 verse 31 it says. And when they had prayed the place was shaken. Where they were assembled together and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. What brought about this desperate measure to pray for such a move of God? It was their desperation because they were under persecution. They realized they had a need that they needed God to come and fill them. And God did not only fill them, but he came to shake the very foundations of that building. When you are desperate, when you really come to a reflection of who you are without God, and without God we can do nothing. So what the Bible says, it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it is by the power of the Holy Ghost. It is by the power of God. We need that type of desperation. We need that type of revelation that without God, and we are so desperate for Him, and we need to awaken from our slumber, that God will come and visit the church once again. Hallelujah. In the book of Acts 16 verse 25 to 26 and at the midnight hour Paul and Silas they prayed and they sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and suddenly all the doors were open and everyone's hands were loosened they were loosened. The bands that were binding them were loosened because they were crying out to God. They had been flogged. They had been beaten. But God came and brought an earthquake to shake the very foundations of the prison. Hallelujah. Even in their midst of their affliction and their torment and their persecution, they still cried out to God. And God came to visit them. God will come to shake the very foundations of your life, to bring you into the will of God. Hallelujah. We are talking about that type of prayer that shakes and shifts and moves and changes our very environment. The Bible says in James 5 verse 16, Hallelujah. It says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed for the Effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man shall availeth much. 
It said that Elijah was a man subject to the passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth its fruit. We are talking about an ordinary person. He is saying that Elijah was also a man with the passions that you have, with the temptations that you have, with all the frailties that you have. But when he prayed, God heard his prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. It wasn't that he was mighty, he was greater, he was better than anyone else. It was his dependence on God that he knew without God he could do nothing. When the church realized that they can do nothing without God, then God is going to move in that place. God will move in your life. Because the fervent prayers of a righteous man, they shall availeth much. The earnest, fervent, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man. It makes tremendous power available. It is dynamic power that's in now very working. Hallelujah. God has given each of us that. Elijah believed in God. And his God came to meet him. And that's why people even today say the God of Elijah that responded with fire. He is the same God that will respond to your prayers when you are so desperate for God that without God we can do nothing. Hallelujah. We can do nothing without God. But with all God more mighty, when we cry out to him, he will visit us. He will meet us like never before. Because of our desperation, we say, God, visit us afresh tonight. Visit us afresh. You know, I came across a story that was taken from the unabridged writings of Marco Polo. And it says that in Iraq, in the year of 1225, there was a small community of Christians. And there are about 100,000 Christians living within Iraq at that time. And we understand that at that time was also the great battles and the great wars that were fought during that time of the Crusades. But at that time in Iraq, the Muslims had taken over. And there was a particular Muslim that came to what? To attack the Christians. And he was a Saracen. And that Saracen was a Muslim leader who came to attack and to kill them. And he thought, I will use your very scripture to condemn you to death. Because the Bible says, according to the book of Mark, according to the book of Matthew, it says, if you have prayed faith as small as a mustard seed, you speak to this mountain, it shall be moved. I'm going to come back in a certain amount of days, in 10 days. And when I come back, if that mountain is not moved and you have not renounced your faith, then you will all be dead. And the people of that place... They started to fast. They started to seek God. But there was one man in that place. He wasn't one of the cloth. He wasn't one of the priesthood. But he was a shoe cobbler. He mended shoes. And it said that he had one eye. And he prayed. And God shifted that very mountain. Amen. Not because of who he was, but because of who he believed in. Amen. God is not waiting for you to get your life to be perfect before he brings revival. He is wanting you to realize that you are nothing without God. You must understand your wretchedness today that God will bring his power to shake the church once again. The truth is, there is no such thing as a great man or woman of God. 
but rather, rather the opposite, that man is wretched, that man is weak, that man is sinful, that man is frail, who serves a great and a mighty and an awesome and a merciful and a graceful God. We are nothing without God. Anyone that has done anything in the Bible, when God came to shake the very foundations, had an awareness of their frailties, had an awareness of their weaknesses. Because if you reflect your life upon the Word of God, let me tell you, it won't take long for you to realize how frail you are without God. And you're in need of his mercy. And it's only by grace we can do anything for God. Therefore, there is no such thing as a mighty or a great man of God. But rather that we serve a great and a mighty God. And without him we can do nothing. When the church starts to think that their church programs are better than anybody else. Or they can do it without God. That is when God will leave the scene. That's what the Bible says in Psalm 127 verse 1. It says, unless God builds the house, the builder builds it in vain. We need such a revival to come to shake the very foundations of our faith. That we may realize, God, we are so desperate. We're in need of revival in this hour. He spoke in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 6 and 9. It says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake the heaven and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and I shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. God wants to pour out His Spirit that the latter rain of His revival will be greater than the former. Do you desire that? You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. There is no such thing as a physical temple because you are bought with a price. You're a temple of the Holy Ghost. And He wants to come and fill His temple once again with a revival that will shake the very foundations. At a time when the church has become a ground for entertainment, we need revival. At a time when a music minister competes and compares himself with the secular musicians, we need revival. At a time when the altar of God is used for comedians, we need revival. At a time when a successful minister of the gospel is measured by how much or how much wealth he is or how big his car is or how big his house is. Rather than on the impact of the message through the power of the Holy Ghost, we need revival. At a time when passion for souls has been replaced with a fashion parade in the church, we need revival. At a time when we lift men of God higher than Jesus. And I'm talking about all those other titles above Jesus Christ. When we say he is such the mightiest or the mighty or the greatest. There is no other mighty. There is no other greater other than the God we serve. We only have frail, weak, sinful men serving a God that is great and compassionate and merciful. At a time when motivational speaking has replaced biblical preaching, we need revival church. At a time when you really cannot differentiate between a daughter of Zion and that of a harlot, we need revival. At a time when the saints are shedding each other's blood out of jealousy for higher positions, 
There are even some countries that use witchcraft when it comes to that time of elections with overseers and bishops. We need revival. At a time when modern preachers now tell us that Jesus is not coming back soon, we need revival. At a time when modern preachers tell you, don't even bring your Bibles to church anymore, dress any old way, and just get a tattoo wherever you want. Do whatever you want because God loves you. When it becomes more about you and less about self-sacrifice, we need revival. At a time when packaging and special effects has replaced the beauty of God's glory, we need revival. As it was in that church when the smoke machine broke and they said, sorry, we had to close the service because the Holy Spirit could not operate when the smoke machine was out of order. We need revival. At a time where homosexuals are even ordained on the altar of God, we need revival. At a time when sexual sin is referred to as a weakness and just the grace of God is taken for granted, we need revival. At a time when prophets prophesy using demonic powers as a livelihood, we need revival. At a time when the church does not know the difference between the spirit witchcraft spirit and the Holy Spirit we need revival at a time when the church cannot discern the difference between demonic manifestations and the Holy Spirit manifestations we need revival at a time when filling the seats in our place of worship has become a priority over a priority than raising up disciples of Jesus Christ. We need revival. When a church has come to that point where it's all become about fleecing the flock, that means taking the money where prosperity has become the number one object of preachers today when they want to extract money from you we need revival when the poor are not being taken care of when the orphans are not being taken care of when the widows are not being taken care of we need revival at a time when the distress of signs of the world are pointing towards the coming of the Messiah and the church is still asleep. We still need revival. At a time when the church cannot discern the difference between demonic manifestations and that of anything to do with God, we need revival. At a time when sinners feel comfortable in our churches and saints feel no sense of urgency to preach the good news to the lost, we need revival. At a time when pastors are more concerned about how much money members give than how much members truly love the Lord and are repented in their lives, we need revival. At a time when the word of God is scarce and the fire on the altar is going out and the priests have become blind and the watchman sleeping and the holiness is no longer our standard, we need revival. We need a revival, not a program. We need reawakening of our souls, a new awareness of our power, the power of God. We don't need another definition of the gospel, but that definition should be established on the cross of Jesus with the power and the evidence of Him working. We don't need another jamboree, but true repentance coupled with a changed life. That's what we need. We don't need another noise. We need a shaking of the pillars and a mighty rushing wind. We do not need another movement. We need a reformation of repentance revival. A revival that not one ministry can claim for, but the Holy Spirit himself. For he is not a respecter of denominations. He's not a respecter of culture. He's not a respecter of people. He is coming back for a bride. 
We need the Lord to come again and restore us unto himself. We need the Lord to open our eyes again that we may see him. We want to see his holiness again that we may see our depravity. We need a genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are tired of just speaking in tongues and not living Christ-like. There is no desire that we have than to hear again the same voice that spoke in the valley of the dry bones to bring us back to life and speak to those dry bones that they may come back. Our nations are in darkness, yet we are in light. We cannot pretend anymore. We need to activate the power of the Holy Spirit and He will reawaken us. He will revive us again because we do not see our sons and wonders as done by the apostles, but we see them done by God Himself when He comes. There are only a few Jesus prophets in churches. Some are not even recognized. Let us pray that God will start to shake the church once again. That the voice in the wilderness will cry for us and say, God, we need another new move of God. We need a deep lamenting that is needed in this hour, starting from the ministers of the altar. Because Joel 2.17 says, Let the priests, the minister of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and give not your heritage to reproach, that the nation shall rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? Let the pastors and the minister of the Lord weep. Joel 1.13 says, Gird yourself and lament, you priests, while you ministers of the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering is withered and withheld from the house of your God. We need the ministers of God once again to cry out between the porch and the altar. Not of incense, for that was in the holy place, but the great brazen altar, the altar of burnt offering, which stood at some distance from the porch. And here the priests are commanded to stand fast and praying, whence they might even be heard and seen by the people in the next court, in which the people would want to pray. Just as it was back then, we need revival in the pulpit where the altar is cleansed and ministers are leading by example in front of their congregations saying, God, we need revival. At the end of the day, we need revival. Out of all the nations I've gone to, every meeting I've gone to, where God has come in with a thundering message to give an opportunity for people to come into repentance and weeping on their knees. It may be something that lasts for a week or two weeks or a month and then all of a sudden they get another visiting minister that comes with a message that is contrary to this message and they go back that very way. The pastor who doesn't weep for the lost shouldn't expect people to come and weep for their sins. If there is no brokenness in the pulpit, why should there be any brokenness in the pew? You don't have to be perfect before revival comes. Otherwise, it wouldn't come. There'd be no point for revival to come. You can't, like, all of a sudden have everything perfect and expect revival to come. No, it is required upon brokenness. When you realize without God you can do nothing, not by your gifts, not by your talent, not by your strength, then God will visit that place. God will visit the humble. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Hallelujah. Hosea 6, 2 says, after two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Psalm 51, 12 says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willingness spirit to sustain me that I will teach transgressors your
your way so that sinners will come back to you. God needs to restore the joy of our salvation. When the day the blood of Jesus covered you, when the Holy Ghost filled you up, you need God to revive you back to that state. Psalm 71, 20. Though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again from the depths of the earth. You will again bring me up. That is the promise of God, people. God wants to revive his people. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I would hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. For now my eyes and my ears are attentive to me, to the prayer made in this place. God is looking for a humble brokenness in your heart. Will you cry out to him tonight? When God's people become that thirsty for God and realize their need to be spiritually restored and revitalized in their own personal walk with Jesus becomes more than anything else. That is when God starts to move. Hallelujah. As it was in Psalm 24 verses 3 to 4. It says, who can stand in that holy mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in that holy place? But only those with clean hands and pure hearts. Oh Lord, we need a revival. Cleanse our hands. Purify our hearts, Lord. Isaiah 44, 3 says, And I will pour water onto the thirsty and flood on the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit on your descendants. God's promise is not only for you, but also for your descendants. Isaiah 43 verse 26. Put me in remembrance and let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Oh Lord, whatever you're passing through today, allow God to bring you through and acquit you through that situation. He will beat your case. As long as he is your number one case to get to know God. Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord issued, making wise the simple. Oh Lord, revive us again. Revive our souls. Psalm 51, 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God is speaking to you today. God is speaking to you through his word. Habakkuk 3, 2. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In the wrath, remember mercy. This is God's word. It speaks to our souls. Oh, Lord. The Bible says, he searches our hearts. He searches our minds. Is it your passion to know God tonight? Psalm 22 verse 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. They will bow down. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess. Acts 3.19, repent therefore that your sins may be forgiven, that times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord. We need that time of refreshing in the presence of the Lord that will strike us down and bring us to our knees. Psalm 85 verse 6, won't you revive us again that we may rejoice in you, O Lord. Psalm 80 verse 18, then we will never abandon you again. Revive us so we can call on your name once more. Psalm 119 verse 25. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word, Lord. Allow the word of God to revive you tonight. Psalm 119 50. Your promises revives me. It comforts me in all my troubles. Psalm 119, 149. In your faithful love, O Lord, hear my cry. Let me be revived by following your regulations. 
Isaiah 1, 27. Zion will be restored by justice. Those who repent will be revived by righteousness. Isaiah 57 verse 15, the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the holy and holy of place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. God is speaking to us tonight. He will only come after those with a humble and a contrite spirit. They are the only ones that live in heaven. Humble us today, Lord. Remove the high and lofty ones. Ezekiel 29, 21. And the day will come when I will cause the ancient glory of Israel to revive. And then Ezekiel. Your words will be respected. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. He wants to come and revive not only the church, but also Israel. That is a promise for Israel. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43 verse 20. The wild animals in the fields will thank me. The jackals and the owls too for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. God will bring a time of revival. He will bring a time of living waters to fill you up. Are you thirsty for him? Isaiah 38 16. It says, O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these is the life of my spirit. O oh, restore, revive me to the health, and let me live. Ezra 9 verse 9, for we were slaves, but in his unfailing love, our God did not abandon us in our slavery. Instead, he caused the kings of Persia to treat us favorably. He revived us so that we could rebuild the temple of our God and repair its ruins. He has given us a protective wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Hallelujah. God wants to revive you in his unfailing love. Psalm 47, 41 verse 3. The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to health. Psalm 23 verse 3. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Mark 1 verse 15, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. It is not a time to delay. It is a time to repent. It's a time to repair. The Messiah is coming. Isaiah 61 verse 7, instead of your shame, you should have double. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be upon them. God's double portion is available to those that cry out with a humble and a broken spirit. Jeremiah 17, 10. For the Lord searches the heart. He searches the mind and examines the heart. He examines the mind and searches the heart. He is searching. He is searching tonight. There's nothing that's hidden by the Lord. Ask the Lord to search you to remove any sins from your life. Those that you think that God doesn't know. God even knows your thoughts. Confess them to the Lord. And ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, help me. Search my heart. Search my mind for anything that is not pleasing with you. Renew me by your steadfast spirit. James 1 6 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave. If there is something doubtful in your life, it must be removed. That is something that you're not sure about. Whether that thing be good or bad. Remove it from your life. 
and allow the King of Glory to take first place. Urabasi. Job 11.13 says, Surrender your heart to God. Turn to Him in prayer. Surrender your heart to God. Total surrender to the Spirit. You must do and say all that He asks us to do. You must obey. You must surrender to the Spirit of God and do what He's telling you to do. Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe it in our hearts, everything comes from public confession. Lord, search our hearts. Search our motives. What is our motives? We want you to be known. We don't want to be known. We want you to be known. That when we pass this life, that they will know Christ. That's why Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ now lives within me. Oh Lord, let it not be about us, but let it be about you. That we may die and become dead to ourselves. The problem today with the mega church model is that we are filling the churches up, but we are not sending the people out. We are more interested in the, the laurels on seats rather than making disciples that will go forth and make those disciples. Witness in the workplace, witness in these different places. Imagine the upper room, it fit 120 people. But they did not try to build a mega church in that upper room. But rather, they went out from the upper room because they sent them out with the power of the Holy Ghost. God needs to change something. God needs to stir something up. You are filled with waters. But until those waters are loosened, you are a dam and there is no outlet. As it is with the Dead Sea, there is no outlet for that place. That is why it's become dead. Many churches have become like the Dead Sea. There is no outlet. Oh Lord, we need revival. We need revival. The Bible says in Isaiah 30 verse 31, The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria with his rod. He will strike them down. With a shout, God will bring a shaking. Psalm 40, 47 verse 1. Oh, clap your hands, all you his peoples. Shout to his name. God is looking for a church that will cry out in this hour. The Bible says in Psalm 134 verse 2. Lift up your holy hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. 1 Timothy 2, 8, Therefore I desire the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or dissension. Oh Lord, send revival. Break us, Lord. When you lift up your hands, there's a sign of surrender. See, God knew that Satan would do everything to stop us from lifting up holy hands. He doesn't want you. He wants you to feel discouraged. He wants you to bring you to that point where you say, oh, that a tough week or whatever it is, every excuse that you won't raise up your hands and say, God, I will praise you during this storm no matter what the outcome. I believe in you. I believe you. You reside in me. You are the power inside of me. Today, Lord, we declare that we will no longer think as natural with natural minds because a natural mind is an enmity with God. But we will begin to think spiritually. The Lamb of the tribe of Judah is roaring on the inside of us. In the power of the name of Jesus, we are becoming as a lion to say, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! The Bible says we'll become as bold as lions to declare our frailty. Paul boasted in his weakness and he said that in your weakness that I am strong, saith the Lord. God, 
God is not looking for anything you can give to God. He is saying, come to me as broken vessels that are desperate and I will restore you. I will heal your broken hearts. I will restore the things that the locusts have stolen. I will revive your churches. I will heal that body. I will deliver you from that generational curse. I will restore your marriage. I will bring your children back that have gone in their prodigal ways. I am the God. I am that I am. And he who has called you, he is faithful and he will do it. He will restore your marriage because he will do it. He will restore your finances because he will do it. He will revive your church, not because of how good your program is or how pious our preaching has become, but because he will do it. Lord, we are in need of your revival. Shake us, mold us, melt us into your image. That we may say it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. You said unless that seed falls to the ground and dies, it will not bear fruit. Oh Lord, let that seed die inside of us. That we may bear fruit. And fruit that will last. Send revival to us. Send revival to us. We need revival. We need a shift. We need a change. We need something to change within our lives. It can't stay the same, Lord. It cannot stay the same any longer. It cannot stay the same. Will you allow it to stay the same? God is saying, if he becomes our number one focus, if a relationship with God is your number one focus, then everything else will be taken care of. Lord, we are desperate for you. We can't do anything without you. Change us. Mold us. Melt us. As the beginning church prayed, you heard their prayers. As Elijah prayed, you heard his prayer and you sent fire. As the apostles prayed, you shook the building. When Isaiah came before the Lord, even the pillars shook at your name. Everything that can be shaken shall be shaken. As you've said, according to Hebrews 12, it says, will I not shake the heavens and the earth once again? You want to shake. You want to shake the very foundations. Any foundation that is not in Christ Jesus shall be shaken. Shake us now, Lord, before it's too late. Shake the compromise. Shake the wickedness. Shake the lukewarmness. Shake any deadness from us. Shake any religion from us. We need you, God. We need you to visit. We need you to come to the nations, to shake the nations once again. We don't want just a quick fix move. We want a move, pure move of the Holy Ghost. There will be a transformation. The people will start to come into the image of Christ himself. Change us. Melt us. Break us. We need you. We need you, Lord. We need you to move like never before. We need you to move in our lives. We need to shake the very foundations of everything that we have believed or put our trust in. Urabasi. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Jabez, it says, according to 1 Chronicles 4, 9, it says, Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain, and Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him his request. So literally, his name, Jabez, meant pain. 
to be brought into pain. He was cursed from his birth, from his name. It doesn't matter what anyone else has said about you, what anyone has called you. Maybe you have a nickname. Maybe someone's calling you all sorts of things. It doesn't matter what other people say. When he cried out for God to bless him, God heard his prayer. And God will hear your prayers. That you will be a blessing to others. He prayed God would bless him. That God would enlarge his borders and territory. He prayed God's hand would be upon him. He prayed that God would keep him from evil. Just as Jabez cried out, we also need to cry out today that you will be the very one to break the family curse that is coming down your family line. You will be the very one that brings the change, that brings your whole family into revival. Because you decided to cry out to God and say, God bless me. Not for myself, but I can be a blessing to others. He said, bless me that I may bless others. That I, you may enlarge my territory and my borders. And that God's hand would be upon him. As Moses said, God, I do not want to go anywhere unless you go with me. Is that how desperate you are for God? That you want God to go before you. That you want the hand of God to be with you as it was with Jabez. And just think, out of that whole chronological line, this is one person that is significant, that sticks out, that his prayer would go on for generations to generations for us to even talk about tonight. And he prayed that God would keep him from evil because our sin not only causes problems for ourselves, but also will cause problems for those around us. When you sin, it affects your family. It affects your marriage. It affects those around you. It affects your church. But God is merciful. He's saying, cry out to me. And I will forgive you. Come to me with a humble and a broken heart. And I will remember you. Hallelujah. Amen. God's intention for us is to be a blessing. That we can bless others. Lord, I pray that you would bless us so we can bless others. In a time of great discouragement, God spoke through Isaiah 54 verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. God wants you to see beyond your circumstances right now. He wants you to enlarge your life. If you will join Him by praying and believing in His blessing. When Jabez prayed for God's hand to be with him, He's also encouraging us. What is God saying to you which you have been ignoring? What have you dreamed about? but dis dismiss because you thought it was impossible to dream. God is saying, allow that dream to come back. Begin to pray for the hand of God to be upon your life that you may accomplish that very thing that God has shown you. There's nothing that is impossible. Oh Lord, we cry out to you today that you would revive us. Revive us. Revive us. Revive us, Lord. Revive us. Revive us. Revive us. Revive us, Lord. Revive us today. We're in desperate need of revival. We're in desperate need of a touch by you. Just as those that have gone out before us, the forefathers of faith that have prayed, that we've been inspired by because it is your word. Lord, it is your word, and you are the word that became flesh. 
And through you, your words give life and they give us life today. We are believing in greater things. We are believing, Lord, that we know that we are wretched, that we are frail, that we are sinful, that we are wretched, that there is nothing good in us, but all things are good that is in you. Let it not be I that live, but Christ that liveth within us. Greater is he that lives within you than he that lives in the world. O oh Lord, arise up within us and stir up such a revival within our hearts that we will be so desperate for you that you will shake the very foundation of our faith and we will believe in more and we will want more. Lord, we are, we are so hungry for you. We are so thirsty for you. I want you to start to call upon God right now. The word of God has been delivered to you. But has that word planted the seed within your heart? That word, that promise of revival. Is that germinating a seed within your heart? Is that stirring up? An unsettledness with inside of you to know there must be more. Where God is saying, surely I will wake up this sleepy church once again. God wants to awaken the sleepy church. Are you that sleepy church today? Ephesians 5.14, this is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Awaken. Awaken, sleeper, sleeper in the church, sleeper in the pews, sleeper in home. Awaken, awaken and rise from the dead because Christ will shine upon you. God wants to arise and shine upon you today. Isaiah 60 verse 1, arise and shine that the glory of the Lord may rise upon you. Allow God to arise upon you. Change our hearts. Search our hearts. Search our hearts. Search our minds. Search everything within us. Anything that's contrary within our life to your word. Anything that's not matching up, change us. Mold us, melt us. It's not about us, it's about you. We don't want just everyone agreeing with us. But Lord, we are not here. We are here that our lives may agree with you. Shake us, melt us, mold us into your image. He is the pot and we are the clay. Have your way. We know that you have time in your hands. You have this world in your hands. There's nothing we need to be concerned about. You have gone before us. You've made an acquittal on our case. You've done everything. All we need to do is stand upon the promises of God and believe that you will bring revival to us. Let that revival start with me. You don't need to have all your ducks lined up before revival comes. No. God will come when you're broken, when you're wretched and you realize you're in need of a savior. When you're so desperate, you realize that it doesn't matter how good you preach or how good you minister. None of those things matter because he will say to them on that day, get away from me. I did not know you. Lord, we are desperate to know you for this is eternal life. John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, God, and your Son, the Christ. We want to know you, and we know that those that know you will do great exploits. But the exploits follow knowing you. We want to know you, Lord. Change us. Transform us today. The church is in a time of needing revival. We need revival. We need a change. Bring that change to pass. Let it start with me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.